Father, we want to thank you again for your word, and we thank you, God, for this great uh, text in Romans chapter 8. Father, it's certainly one of my favorite chapters of the scripture, and Father, it's filled with so many precious and powerful promises, Lord, that God, we just need to just absorb them and take these truths in. So I pray, Father, as we do, that you give us a spirit and a heart of faith to receive your word, and God, that our lives would be transformed, that we might walk in the spirit, Father, according to your word. So God, bless this message. Bless our understanding. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, uh, Romans 8, so we are on truths. We're going to try, actually, we're not, I'm not even going to pretend. We're not going to get through truths. Uh, 28. Uh, we'll get through 28, but probably not 29 and 30 till next week, uh, next Sunday, uh, because I've got two pages of text here, so probably not going to happen. So when the beeper goes off, we're done, right? That's how it works. It's supposed to, anyway, in theory. Well, as a reminder, as we're going through Romans chapter 8, um, in Romans chapter 8, we have a series of truths that I talked about. You look at Romans chapter 8, and it dawned on me as I started this series that there aren't any commandments in Romans chapter 8. It's all promises and truths that are enumerated for us to receive by faith and believe them, and then to walk in light of the truth. There's no commandment. There's not even a commandment to walk in the Spirit in Romans chapter 8. There is in, in Galatians chapter 5, but Romans chapter 8, it's not there. And so we have these, these truths, I think I enumerated 89 truths, uh, that, we're, that are here for us to believe. And so, uh, as is my custom, as we've been going through, I want to uh, reiterate the patterns of grace. Grace begins with a promise from God, that God will do the impossible. And again, looking at the life of Abraham in particular, you see how Abraham received the promises of God by faith, and then God simply fulfilled his word. And that's how the Christian life is supposed to be. That we receive the promise from God that God will do the impossible. And as we read through Romans chapter 8, we see the impossible is that God can make us redeem sinners transform us into the image of Jesus Christ. And in a practical sense, it means that we begin to show concrete and tangible expressions of love toward one another and toward everyone, frankly. But particularly within the body of Christ, that we should begin to manifest that, that fruit of the Spirit, which is love, in concrete ways. So, believe it or not, God can make us to love one another. And, and by the way, that's a miracle. In this world, I don't know... You know, all you need is love. I think the Beatles coined that phrase. Uh, we still need a lot of love in this world. There's, there's not a lot of love in the world. And so Jesus said, By this shall all men know that you're my disciples if you have love one for another. So the Spirit of God is, is working in us to produce this sacrificial expression of love. And that is a miracle. Because we naturally, we love ourselves. We're not so good at loving other people the way we should. So it begins with a promise from God. The pattern of grace begins with a promise from God that God will do the impossible. And that comes by the Word of God. It comes in a word, an expression from God that is contained in this book, the Bible. So it comes to us in word. And then we respond. Our part is faith. We respond to the Word of God with faith. And faith, faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. So we receive the Word of God and we respond in faith. And what does that look like? Well, again, looking at Abraham, uh, we, we can come up with this phrase, God has promised to do the impossible, and guess what? I am persuaded that God will do the impossible. I really believe that. And as, as I've been meditating on this, and look, I'm, I'm preaching to myself. You guys just didn't get to come into my mind as I open up my mouth and express what's in my heart. Um, so it's like a bonus. I get to just share what's in my heart. It's very easy to do. But as I've meditated upon this, there has come a, a fresh freedom, a liberty that comes with just, just trusting, just resting in the Word of God, what God has said He will do. 
And instead of you know, instead of taking the word of God and, and questioning it and say, well, you know, let me massage this. I don't think it really means this. You know, like the disciples when when Jesus said, okay, guys, uh, I'm just letting you know, um, the kingdom they've rejected me. The kingdom is not going to come to pass now, uh, and like you thought, the messianic kingdom, um, and I'm going to be crucified and buried, but I'm going to raise again the third day. And they they pondered, mm, what does that mean? Mm. Jesus said he'll raise from the dead. What can that mean? Well, it meant he would raise from the dead. It's exactly what he meant. God doesn't stutter or stammer, particularly as he speaks to his children. He speaks very plainly to us. So we can take God as word. And so faith, the response is, I am persuaded that God will do the impossible. See, it's not like under the Old Testament or Old Covenant where God gave a command and your responsibility was to do something. If you did something, then you would be rewarded. But see, we, we have the hearing of faith. I am persuaded that God will do the impossible. And the end result is that the Spirit of God, with that combination, God does the impossible through miracle power. And of course, you look at Galatians chapter 3, verses 1 through 5, where Paul chastised the Galatian believers because they wanted to get God's blessing and be the super Christians. Okay, yeah, you, you believed on Jesus, that's great, but that's, that's just the first wicked. That's, that's baby stuff now. Now you move on from that, and you, now you can really be super Christians and keep the law, so it's based on your behavior that God's really pleased and pours the blessing upon you. And he chastised the, the Galatians. Oh, foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? And so he, he reiterated that the, the miracles, the power of God, he did it by the hearing of faith. And so God transforms our lives supernaturally as we hear the Word of God and respond in faith that God can actually take Ron Tabor and make him into a, a vessel that, that has a sweet fragrance of Christ. Now, now, this is an ongoing work. It's called sanctification. It takes you know, the rest of my life. And if, if I were to live in this mortal flesh for a, a trillion years, I would still have work to do. But praise God, we're going to see there's an inheritance that... He's going to put an end to this sanctification process. Um, but anyway, so this is the process, and this is, this is the fundamentals of grace, that God speaks a promise, we receive the promise by faith, and then God does a miracle uh, as a response to that faith and faithfulness to His Word. So let's look at the text in Romans 8, 14 through 17. And again, when the beeper goes off, we'll be done. With maybe a little tidy... You know, Tidying up, right? I always get like five, ten minutes of tidy up time. So, um, but anyway, uh, okay. Romans eight fourteen through seventeen says, "For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. For you have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit." that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs. Heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. If so be that we suffer with Him, that we may be also glorified together. Okay. The first truth that we're going to pull out here is that we are heirs of God. We are heirs of God. Now, um, we've covered this text before uh, about being the children, the sons of God, of the Spirit of God, it says, uh, we have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. This is our new relationship to God. It's no longer the relationship of a servant to the Master, but now we are the children of God, and according to, to that relationship uh, in the New Covenant, uh, then we are heirs by birth. We're not servants laboring to please a Master. We are now sons and daughters of God who are heirs based on our relationship to God. Now, again, to simplify this, you know, the question, you know, as I meditate on these things, I, I like clarity. I don't like ambiguity. I don't like uncertainty because a lot of error can creep up in that environment. So I want precision from the Word of God. And so just to assure yourself so you understand, and you can answer the question authoritatively, am I a child of God? And you know, a lot of times, unfortunately, preachers and pastors will say, well, let's look at your behavior, and if we see a certain pattern of behavior developing, then maybe we can kind of get an idea if you're really a child of God or not. 
and, and really even then we're not real certain, but we got some real good indicators, you know. Um, well, let's see what the scriptures say in, in, in Galatians 3.26. Paul says this, and I think it's pretty plain. It says, For ye are all the children of God by faith in Jesus Christ. That's what the Word of God says. Ye are all the children of God by faith in Jesus Christ. So now we can, we can we have something substantive to sink our teeth into and say, am I a child of God? Because when I look back this past week, I, I, I discover I didn't really live like a child of God should live. I, there were areas I, I had to confess my sin, and, and some sins I still haven't confessed, some sins I'm not even aware of, some habitual patterns I'm not aware of. I wonder if I'm even saved. You know, I, I bring that up a lot. <laughs> I wonder if I'm even saved. Uh, I'm not in that point now. I know that I'm saved, but this has been my struggle throughout my Christian walk because I routinely recognize there's sin in my life that is not pleasing to God. And But praise God, God puts me, usually has to put me into a, a spiritual crisis, and then that crisis forces me into the Word of God, and then He liberates me from the fear and the uncertainty and the bondage that's there. So you can know that you are a child of God by faith in Jesus Christ. If you have placed your faith in Jesus Christ on the authority of the Word of God, you are a child of God. Period. I don't care how your behavior was. I don't care what your thought life was. As far as your relationship to God, you are a child of God by faith in Jesus Christ. And I say that on the authority of the Word of God. Amen. Now, we're, we're going to move forward into behavior. You know, God is concerned about your behavior. It's very important, our, our behavior. And by the way, we're going to find out in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, if we get to that before it beeps, uh, we're going to find out that we're going to give account for the works that we do. It's, it's not as though that the works don't matter. We just kind of float through life and, and kind of serve the flesh and walk in the flesh and kind of, you know... Uh, uh, get all the, the carnal pleasure here and then, then heaven there, which we will. Do you know, I, I love saying this because it's true, uh, from, from uh, Yankee Arnold, I love my Yankee. Um, Yankee says, uh, I couldn't go to hell if I tried to. I could not go to hell if I tried to. Because my sin, everything I have done or will do has been placed upon the Son of God and He has been punished for my sin. Now, do I want to do that? No, I don't. I have a desire in my heart to do righteousness, but the truth is there that I cannot go to hell. God cannot judge His children because they have been judged already in Jesus Christ. So, we can, we can know authoritatively, not based upon our feelings or not based upon our behavior, we can know authoritatively in the Word of God that we are children of God by faith in Jesus Christ. Okay? So now let's start to, to, to connect the dots of, of our inheritance. Um, the Spirit itself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. So now you have this internal, this internal sense and an awareness that we are the children of God, this authenticating voice or, or, or an awareness, a spiritual awareness. And the way I describe it is, before I was saved, um, I viewed God as a distant and angry judge. I mean, it, to me, it was the typical of the white beard, angry stick, ready to smack me. I was always under a sense of condemnation. I had a very sensitive conscience. I certainly did not view God as my father, as a loving father. But now, as a child of God, I pray to... I mean, I just instinctively pray to my God as my father. It's instinctive. I don't, I don't have to logically think it through. Okay, oh, God is my father. Okay, so yeah, okay, it's free, good today to talk to, to my father. It's just instinctive. I cry out to my God and I share my thoughts and my struggles and, and our prayer and my prayer for whatever it is that I'm, I'm asking, my Abba, my Daddy. And it's instinctive now. And why is that there? It's because I believed upon Jesus Christ and I believe upon Jesus Christ. And the Spirit of God resides in me and compels me to relate to my God. And oh, by the way, I didn't pray before, before I was saved. I really didn't have this instinctive desire to talk to my father. I wanted to actually stay as far away from God as I could. That's why I didn't go to church and all that stuff. But anyway, the Spirit itself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God. 
uh, an heir. What does the word heir mean? Give me some any synonyms for heir. What's associated with being an heir? Inheritance. An inheritance. Very good. The word itself, as I look it up, uh, it, it means at its core getting an apportionment or a sharer by lot. And so we are heirs of God. We are going to inherit uh, from God the riches that He has in store for us. And the word heir comes from, as closely related to the word heredity. And heredity is a transmission of characteristics from one parent to the offspring by means of genes. As I thought about that as the children of God, what have we inherited uh, um, um, uh, her hereditarily speaking, if that's a word, uh, what is our spiritual heredity as it relates to God? Righteousness. Righteousness, exactly. That the righteousness of God has been imputed to our account. Ashley, maybe you could preach next week on this. It's very good. You're, you're, getting, you're getting all the happy faces here. Your stickers for the week. Stars and smiley faces. Um, but uh, we, um, we have received the very righteousness of God in Jesus Christ. That's why God cannot judge us. In fact, He is compelled to bless us because we have the righteousness of Christ. But the devil will say, oh, but did, did you, don't, you don't remember what you did last week? And that's being charitable when I say last week, probably in the last 30 minutes. Driving to church, right? Well, let's quit arguing before we get in there. Just... Take care of that and let's get in there and smile. Let's go. Get, her, get your church face on. I mean, that never happens to me and Jana, but I've heard it happens to people in this church. Okay? We've got to get our church face on, right? So, um, God, God sees us as righteous in Christ Jesus, and now, because we're family, now we are heirs. God is going to give us the riches of the inheritance. So, I thought it would be appropriate... That we go through and say, hey, okay, what, uh, you know, my, my wife, for some reason, she loves to, loves to look at what her mother put down in her notebook. Well, who's getting what? And uh, sometimes she even gets a little bossy and starts picking out things that she wants. Uh, hopefully the sisters aren't watching this sermon right now, but, because um, she get in the car, I'm just telling you. But um, anyway, um, so I thought it would be good to itemize, what do we inherit? What are we going to inherit from our Father? And this is just, look, you could go on and, and, and just the riches of the things, you could itemize these things and rejoice in them. So I just wrote down uh, eight things, and this is probably what we'll get through, is, are these eight things. Um, Ephesians 1.11 says, In whom, in Christ, also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestinated according to the purpose of him, who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will. So God has predestinated, predestinated us, and we have obtained an inheritance. We have an inheritance in our God. And so let's itemize these things. Luke 18, 18, um, a certain ruler asked Jesus, came to him and asked him, saying, Good master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Now, that's the, the common thinking of man. That's our default position that, God, in order to inherit eternal life, I've got to do something. I've got to perform. That's what all religion is based off of. All man-made religion has at its core, I have to do something to obligate God to give me blessing. And that's a lie from hell. It's an assumption that you have anything to offer God, that you can do anything for the Creator. No, no, no. We're, we're the recipients of blessing. But the point that I want to draw out here is, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Well, what do we do to inherit eternal life? You believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ, and you have eternal life. You've inherited. That's the first gift. Now, I think a lot of times we just take this for granted. Eternal life, it's like, it's, it's, it's like this mystical thing, you know, and like, yeah, in the, in the sweet by and by, you know. But Paul told Timothy to lay hold on eternal life. You know, there's a certain zeal and a boldness that comes with the knowledge that death is now just a shadow to me. I have nothing to lose. What was it? Uh, uh, 
famous missionary, the, the, the Alka Indians, uh, he said, He is no fool who will give that which he cannot keep to gain that which he cannot lose. Jim Elliott. Jim Elliott. Thank you, Diane. When you lay hold upon eternal life, I remember watching a show, uh, it was called, this, Logan won't know this one, but I don't think it, only the gray heads will know this one. Uh, Balky, remember Balky, what was that show in the 80s? Uh, Channel would know it. Anyway, this goofy Balky guy, um, he took some medicine where he thought he couldn't die. And then he started doing all this crazy stuff, like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go parachute off an airplane. I've always wanted to do that. And so he did this and was doing all this crazy stuff because he thought he couldn't die. And I remember watching that even decades before, back in the 80s. We are in Germany when I saw this episode. Um, I can't think of the name of it either. But um, anyway, I, I remember being that God impressed, impressed upon me or he showed me something. Ron, why, why can't you live your life like that, eternal life? God's given you eternal life. Cannot we go out in faith, boldly, knowing that we have eternal life? Shouldn't that embolden us to step out in faith and say, I can serve God here. I can lay down and risk something here because I know I have eternal life. I know whom I've believed. I am persuaded that He is able to keep that which, he's commit, which I've committed unto Him against that day. So we will inherit, we have inherited eternal life, and therefore when death comes to us, and it will, barring the rapture of the church, it is merely a shadow. We step out of this body, our consciousness, as we talked about Thursday night, our consciousness will separate out from this body, which is all we have known, right? Where our body goes, our consciousness goes, our soul goes, wherever our body goes. I'm aware of this room because I'm in the room, in the room right now. But God one day is going to call us forth out of this body and our consciousness will separate from the body and the body will stay here and then go into the ground. But our consciousness, we will ascend, if you've believed in Jesus Christ, will ascend into the splendor of heaven. And sorrow and pain that you are experiencing is transformed into joy. And the inheritance of eternal life becomes very, very relevant and important and significant. So that's a hope that we have. We're going to inherit, and we have inherited eternal life. Uh, point number two, uh, 1 Peter 3, 7. Likewise, you husbands, dwell with them according to knowledge, with the wives, giving honor unto the wife, as unto the weaker vessel, and as being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers be not hindered. Um, the grace of life. Boy, you could just sit and chew on that for a while. The grace of life. The, the first thought that came to me is that, that, that life itself is a grace gift. Um, and yet, with life, God pours, He lavishes more grace. He, as we read in, in, in John chapter 10, he, he comes not to ju just give us this mundane life, the dull life, but abundant life. The grace of life. See, that's how God operates with us, is, is in grace. So we are heirs together of the grace of life. And everything that we have in life, the life itself is a grace gift from God. That eternal life and that abundant life. The life full of riches and joy and just a healthy soul. Don't you want to have a healthy, rich soul? Well, you walk in the Spirit and you'll have that kind of a soul. And I'm kind of segueing into our James chapter 2 sermon that will come at the end of Romans 8 as a parenthetical message. But the grace of life. We have a God who is rich in mercy and rich in grace. And that is given to us in Jesus Christ. Uh, 1 Corinthians 15, 41 through 44. Our next uh, inheritance is a resurrected body, a spiritual body. Uh, there is one glory of the sun and another glory of the moon, another glory of the stars. For one star differs from another star in glory, so also is the resurrection of the dead. It is sown in corruption. It is raised in incorruption. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a natural body. 
It has raised a spiritual body. There is a natural body, and there is a spiritual body. And our resurrected body, just by looking at these, these passages, we, we glean several truths. First of all, our resurrection body will be incorruptible. Do you know that in the, in, in the Messianic kingdom, we will not visit doctors? Uh, your little knee thing over there, Deborah, ain't happening in the kingdom. We have a resurrected body, and that occurs. We receive our resurrected body at the rapture of the church, the harpazo. When the trumpet sounds, our bodies, our corruptible, decaying bodies, dying bodies, will be transformed into bodies that will never be corrupted. In corruption. Imagine that. No headaches, no backaches, no pain. You know, in this body we groan, the Apostle Paul says, in, in Romans chapter 8, we get later into Romans chapter 8, there's a sense of groaning, this agony. You know, a lot of times, how many times have we prayed for people? They're, they're in, in physical pain and anguish. People who've had terminal illness, we prayed for miracles and, and it wasn't answered in the way that we prayed it. People that are in chronic pain, we pray. And God, God gives them the strength of spirit to get through the day, but He doesn't take away that pain. A day is coming when our bodies will be incorruptible. There will be no pain. There will be no suffering. Uh, it's a glorious body. We're going to be raised with a glorious body, a radiant uh, body. We're going to see, in fact, I'll just skip down there. Matthew 13, 43, it says, Then shall the righteous shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their Father. Who hath ears to hear, let him hear. We enter into the kingdom with our glorified bodies, we will shine forth as the sun. The Bible says that. There's a substance to our bodies. It's eternal. I mean, we just cannot fathom these things because we all decay. I, I, you look at football players. I remember, you know, I remember kind of gauging my age. I'm getting old when I became older than the football players who are playing football. And, and what do we got now? We got uh, Tom Brady is 41 years old. He's playing. He wants to make it to 45. Like, oh man, 45-year-old quarterback. But even the great Tom Brady, man, there comes a point where his body cannot throw a spiral anymore. His body somehow cannot take a 300-pound linebacker crushing him to the turf. It's going to hurt a little bit more. It's going to, <laughs> going to have to heal a little bit longer. But we're going to have a glorious body, incorruptible and glorious. It's sown in weakness, it's raised in power. I was thinking about... Um, Shirley, I was thinking about Sharon when you were talking about her in Sunday school. And my thought at that time was, she hasn't slept since she left her body over a year ago. She has been filled with the power and the joy of the Lord Jesus Christ. And as I've said before, there's never a time where she said, Oh, I've had too much, too much fun in worship, God. I've got, I've got to go sit down in my place and rest. No, there's energy and joy. There's a power that comes with resurrection life. And our bodies will never grow tired and weary. Uh, it's a spiritual body. It's a body that is geared for the glory and splendor of eternity. It is a body that's incorruptible. A body that will never, 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 never wear out. I mean, fathom that. Meditate upon that. And let that grip your soul. And transform the way you live your life. You see, we have substantive hope to bring to a dying world. It's, it, it, it's more important than filling the food bag. Right? It's more important than that. It's more important than putting shingles on a roof for your neighbor. See, those things are all going to wear away. But what we have is substantive and eternal in the gospel message. And, and isn't it great that someone shared the gospel with you? Isn't it great that someone, Yankee Arnold again, he, he makes this point, and it's, it's a powerful point. He's like 75 years old. He said, in my 75 years of life, only one person ever came to share the gospel with him. Wow. Only one person. And of course, he believed when he was, I think he was 16, like me. But only one. In other words, he's been a Christian, but no one has come up to him and tried to share the gospel with him. You look back on your own life, how many times have you heard the gospel message? I can think of two instances outside of a church environment where someone tried to come and bring the gospel to me. And fortunately, the first time I heard it, 
at my dinner table, I believed I was saved. Now, God's sovereign over all that. But, but let that not be the case for other people because we were silent. You know, I had to confess sin. Um, I had to confess sin. And, and again, when you start confessing sin, uh, you know, and God really bores in on exactly what the sin is, uh, it's, it's painful to, to even utter it in, in, in the privacy of your prayer closet, your communion with God, even on your own, to say, oh God, I hate to use this word. Ugh. But I had to confess a sh shame of the gospel. I don't want, this isn't a place to talk about that. <coughs> no, uh, this ain't going to go well. I'm not going to talk about it here. And that God showed me there are times where I am ashamed of the gospel. I don't want to talk about it. And why is that? Because the devil, Satan, our flesh, all these factors come in and we forget the riches that we have in the gospel. This passionate com you know, communication of eternal life to those who are perishing. Okay, so, uh, so we've got eternal life, the grace of life. That's a big umbrella term. I love it. Grace of life God gives us. Let's pray and receive that. Uh, a spiritual body that has all these, these beautiful attributes. Isn't it funny how scientists are trying to create these things? We, well, if we tinker with the, the genome, and cr we can make the Superman. They never will. There's no cure for death. The wages of sin is death. The only cure for death is what Jesus Christ has secured for us. So I'm sorry, DARPA, uh, you're not going to create the Superman that's going to uh, live forever. Um, in fact, you're going to incur the wrath of God for tinkering with with man made in the image of God. John 14, 1 through 4. Jesus says, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And where, whither I go, you know, and the way, you know. Jesus Christ has gone into heaven to prepare a place for us. Now, I don't fully comprehend what all that means, but I like what Keith Green says. Hey, man, if, if God created this beautiful world in just six days, He's been up in heaven for 2,000 years preparing a place for us. I'm, I'm doing my best Keith Green here. Um, uh, hey, man... It's like we're living in a garbage can compared to what's going on up there. He's kind of groovy, 70s guy. <laughs> powerful. Listen to his music. It's passionate and powerful. But Christ is preparing a place for us in heaven. Now this, uh, you know, this speaks to the fact that when Jesus Christ comes in the rapture of the church, he is taking us to heaven. That's where the place is prepared. You know where I'm going. And they said, well, we don't know where you're going and we don't know how to get there. You know, they were very candid and transparent and and we find out in John 14, well, he's going to the Father. And you want to go to the Father? He's the way to the Father. So guess what? The, the mansions, the preparations, the places, the dwelling places that Jesus Christ is creating for us, they're in heaven. Well, guess what? He's not going to build a, you know, this like a Chinese city, this massive city with nobody living in it. Or like North Korea, they have the show city where no one lives. He is preparing this place. He's going to come get us and we're going to go and dwell in that place. And then we're going to come back and we're going to reign with Him on the earth. He's preparing a place for us. So not only do we have these glorified bodies, but He's preparing a place, a dwelling place for us. And again, I go back to our consciousness and, and, and our soul. You think in terms of the soul being the consciousness. And our consciousness is, is bound right now to our bodies. And where we go, my consciousness is here. I'm aware of the surroundings in this small area. But one day, God's going to pull me out and take me into the splendor of heaven. And I'm going to see mansions and glorious things. I can't, I can't even fathom what these places are going to be like. But Christ has promised us a place in heaven. And I assure you, how many people like uh, you know, watching these HGTV shows, you know, so we can sit there and covet, right? A little covet television. Oh, I wish we had that house. Man, look at our dump, you know, so you're in grateful, you know, like HGTV. I wish we lived there. You go to parade of homes. You look at these beautiful homes. Our, our place in heaven is infinitely more glorious and filled with splendor than any mansion we could find on earth. Christ has prepared that for us. We inherit, uh, we've, got a, we've got a nice uh, house we're going to inherit. 
Um, let's see, Hebrews 1, 14 um, says, Are they not all ministering spirits or angels? Talking about angels. Are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for them who shall be heirs of salvation? We're heirs of salvation. And you kind of think about like, well, isn't that kind of the same as eternal life? Well, kind of, sort of, but God has promised deliverance for us. Number one, He has promised deliverance from the wrath to come. Do you not see, can we not see that the end days are setting up exactly as the Word of God said and that the wrath of God will begin when, the, when Jesus Christ breaks the first seal and Antichrist is released upon the earth? Can we not see the 800-pound gorilla in the theological, eschatological room that Israel is back in the land today? Can we not see this? For 2,000 years the Jews have been dispersed, just as God said. And now, just as Ezekiel 36 and 37 said, He has gathered His people back to the land. And what do we know? 38 39, Russia and Turkey and the invasion of Iran and Persia. Can we not see these things are setting up? And we know that the wrath of God is going to be poured out upon this earth. When the Antichrist signs a peace covenant with Israel, which, oh, by the way, before 1948 was inconceivable. When he signs that peace covenant with Israel, the wrath of God and the seals and the trumpets and the bowls will begin to cascade forth upon this earth. And guess what? We have salvation, deliverance from that wrath. Amen. We have deliverance. God's promised us salvation. He will deliver us from the wrath to come. Um, it's very important to know that God's not going to leave us in this time of great wrath. It, read through Revelation chapter 6 and on, it's not pretty. There's not anything in there that says, you know, I'd kind of like to be through, through this. Um, it's like, Lord, please take me out of here. We're going to be saved. We're going to be delivered from wrath. The other thing was, I, I, I always kind of think in terms of, of the lake of fire as the wrath of God. And there is that uh, truth that the lake of fire is the, the, the condemnation. And that's the, really the word I want to say. The condemnation. He's delivered us from condemnation. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. So we see here these, these two fundamentals. Number one, I'm going to be delivered. We're going to be delivered from the wrath to come that will be poured out upon the inhabitants of the earth. The whole earth, it says. The inhabitants of the whole earth. We're going to be delivered from that, and we're going to be delivered, salvation, delivered from the condemnation for our sins. Remember we talked about last week the great white throne, and the books are opened, and another book is opened, which is the book of life. And the, everyone was judged out according to the things that were written in the books, and everyone whose name was not written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. You know, unfortunately, a lot of, a lot of Christians... Don't understand this passage. Folks, you, you don't want to be at this judgment. There, there's no one that, that's, that leaves this judgment in the favor and grace of God. Everyone who is standing at that great white throne judgment seat is being judged by their works. And folks, despite your former, was it your neighbor? Yeah. Who had only one sin? Yeah, she still yeah. does. She only, she only <laughs> come up with one sin. Uh, there are volumes written on her. As there are on each one of us, there are volumes of sins written on us. But the blood of Jesus Christ has erased it. Now, remember too, this, I, can't, I can't make enough of this. It is not whether or not your name had, has enumerated events that you're being judged for. That's not the final decision. The final decision is, is your name in the Lamb's Book of Life? Because the Lamb's Book of Life trumps the judgment. Mercy triumphs over judgment. And so it's like, okay, there's still one last chance here. Is your name in the Lamb's Book of Life? You did, not, you did not earn your way into heaven. Okay, let's look. Are you in the Lamb's Book of Life? And unfortunately, at that point, their names are not written there. Those people who are gathered there are not in the Lamb's Book of Life. So God delivers us from condemnation. Now think about the consciousness again. Do you think about an unbeliever who dies in their sin? Okay? 
uh, a lot of a lot of the LDS folks say, oh, well, I'm going to hell because I'm LDS, because I'm Mormon. No, you're going to hell because Mormonism cannot cleanse your sin. Only Jesus Christ can cleanse your sin, and your Messiah is a false Messiah. He's a myth, and he cannot cleanse your sin. So think of this soul, this person is walking around and, and thinking and living his life and making judgments and so forth, and then the chest pain comes, and they drop to the ground, and then they breathe their last, and their consciousness now is separated. Their soul and their consciousness enters into a realm that they did not know existed. And when they are in their sin, they are taken and they are placed in that temporary torment of Hades where the rich man lifted up his eyes and cried out for, for Abraham to just dip his finger in water and touch his tongue. He is in torment and flames. And that consciousness will not have the power to go back into the body. That consciousness will descend into the lake or into Hades and then be cast into the lake of fire and has no power to prevent that. We must believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ to be saved. Okay, three minutes, 46 seconds. 1 Corinthians 6, 9 and 10. Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners, shall inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you. But you are washed, but you are sanctified, but you are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. The point here that I want to draw out is that we inherit the kingdom of God. Now, now think about this. We're, we're heirs of the kingdom. We're going to come back. And, and I, you know, I was on Facebook and I, oh, I'd love to go back to Israel. I'm trying to figure out how I can do that, you know, and to, to, to go back again right before. I'd love to be there, not when the invasion happens, but maybe I could be on the goal line and look down and say, hey, that's the invasion. They're getting ready to invade. And then fly back, you know, before it happens. <laughs> uh, and then watch it all on TV. Um, but when we, when we come back with Jesus Christ, first of all, we're coming back to Israel. So everyone has a ticket stamp. If you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, you have a ticket stamp to come back and see the Holy Land. And we're going to see a tremendous battle when the King of Glory, a sword comes out of His mouth and slays the, the, the armies of Antichrist that have gathered to fight against Jesus. How foolish is that? Oh, they'll turn their guns from the Jews. They'll turn their guns up to to the King of kings and the Lord of lords. What silliness. How foolish are they. But we're going to come back and, and we're going to inherit the kingdom. We're going to rule and reign with Jesus Christ upon the earth for a thousand years. And we are going to cover this globe. The, we're inheriting the earth. So we will be able to go where we want. It's ours. The, Father, it's his, the Father's pleasure to give us the kingdom. And so we will rule and we will reign with Him. I just, I, I'm blown away with these things because there's so much of the earth. I mean, I'm 52, though, let's face it. Uh, if my bucket list is to see all these exotic places, it ain't happening. I don't have the money or the time to do it. But one day I will be able to explore this planet in its rejuvenated glory when the King of glory reigns and the lion will lay down with the lamb it's going to be mind-boggling that we're going to be able to live and reign with Jesus Christ. So we will inherit the kingdom. Why? Because we're so good? No, because we are children of the king. He will bring us into his kingdom and we will reign with him. So, on that note, I have covered, I think I've got all eight of these. I, 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 since I do have 46 seconds, I will say this. Uh, notice Paul says, be not deceived. Be not deceived. The unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God. And we're living in a, in a day today where the, the church of Jesus Christ is allowing all sorts of wickedness into the congregation, into the church. We're welcoming this in, and we are not demanding that they believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, we just, we're just all going to get along. You know, we're, it's, it just kind of sounds like Laodicea, right? We're lukewarm. Hey, we've assumed the temperature of the world around us. Hey, we're all one. We're all children of God. Well, that's a lie. We're not the children of God until we have faith in Jesus Christ. 
be not deceived. The unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God. All right, hey, we're done. Beautiful. Let's go ahead and close in prayer, and we'll be uh, we'll sing our final hymn and be dismissed. Father, I want to thank you for your word, because God, it reveals great, exceeding great and precious promises, Father. And we just looked at a few of them tonight, God, or this morning. And God, we thank you, and I pray, God, as we leave here, that you, would, your Spirit, would would bring these jewels up to our minds, and we would. We would esteem them. We would evaluate them. And God, we would be filled with joy. Father, that we would lift our eyes off of this broken and decaying world and the things that surround us. And Lord, we're so prone to envy and jealousies and, and, and looking at other things covetously. I know that I am, Father. And, and Lord, that we would be content, Lord, looking to the inheritance that is ours as your sons and daughters through faith in Jesus Christ. So, Father, we pray, God, that, that you would change our lives just a little bit more to reflect Jesus Christ. Father, help us not to be ashamed of the gospel, Lord, but to stand firmly in faith, God. And maybe a little bit of uncomfort, a little knee-knocking, but nevertheless to stand in faith and to present the word of God, the gospel of our salvation through the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. So, Lord, we commit the remainder of this week to you for your glory. Empower us, Lord, to walk in your spirit. In Jesus' name.